There are a lot of religions out there who say you cannot challenge our holy book. But the Bible is completely different. It invites people to test it. Our origins matter a lot in exploring this question of what is true and what is not. Because if our universe is created, it means there must be a creator, and that changes the whole game. Truth is highly sought after in these days of information, misinformation and propaganda. But how do we know that what we believe is in fact the truth? Mark, you've been speaking internationally for over three decades on the topic of origins and your videos uh, are receiving almost 10 million views now on social media. With all the misinformation out there in our world, how do we know what is truth? It's a very good question, Jess, because as you say, there's so much out there that seeks to mislead and to deceive. We've all heard of the get-rich-quick schemes that seem to be there and propaganda, particularly in times of war. So there are a number of ways that we come to the point of believing things as being true. Uh, for instance, we the way we're raised in our families, our community might have certain sets of beliefs depending on where we're born and the culture in which we live. Uh, we tend to believe things as children that our parents tell us as being true. But the thing is, our parents and our communities might actually be deceived in some way. So we still need a way that is separate from us to be able to test whether what we actually believe is true. It reminds me of uh, my students sometimes in the classroom they will start to realise for the first time as they share their opinions and thoughts that they've been taught um, with their peers and their peers disagree with them and just seeing them realise, oh, hang on, not everyone believes the same as what I've been taught growing up. Yes, that's right. That's right. So uh, how do we figure out what's true? And there's a very common view that says what I perceive is therefore true. And you might have some other truth from what I've got. So we've each got our own truth. But the problem with that is that there's no reference point and if you believe something different from what I believe, there could be conflict. So clearly one or other of us must be wrong. So this is a, a view called postmodernism. But postmodernism is actually self-refuting because basically what it says is there's no such thing as absolute truth. But that is an absolute truth claim. <laughs> so they've just refuted themselves. Exactly. Yeah. Let's explain that one again. So they'll say absolute truth. They'll, they'll say that whatever I believe is true and there cannot be absolute truth. So truth becomes relative. Mm. So what I believe is true, what you believe is true. Unfortunately, we might believe contrary things, so that immediately creates a problem. I mean, think of it. You could imagine and be totally convinced that you could fly, and so you can get on the top of a high building and leap off, but gravity will very quickly remind you that your perception of truth was not true. <laughs> so there is absolute truth out there, and the postmodernist rejects that idea. But that, you see, is kind of an absolute truth claim that the postmodernist makes. So it's actually self-refuting. A good definition, I think, is something that conforms with reality. Now, that's fine, but how do we determine reality? And in our culture today, most people would say, well, science determines reality because we make observations in the world around us and you can repeat those observations and those things are irrefutable. Mm, so is, is that truth? So science, you would think, therefore, will give us truth. But herein lies a problem because when we make observations in the world around us, we actually interpret the observations in accordance with what we already believe about the physical world around us. Mm, kind of like a, a worldview or a bias? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's in fact a worldview. It's exactly the right word. So we have a, uh, a set of glasses, if you will, that we look at, we look at the world through like these, and we perceive things in accordance with our glasses or, if you like, our mindset, our worldview. For instance, when we uh, consider the whole question of how did we get here, what, are, what are, are our origins, there's a very prevalent worldview in our culture that says we all got here through naturalistic random processes uh, over billions of years. 
And what it seeks to do is actually to say, well, there's really no God. So it's kind of, a, if you like, an atheistic worldview. But it masquerades as science and it's called evolution. So really all it's trying to do is to get rid of God out of our thinking. So that influences how people see the world. They look at mountains, they look at rocks, and they see, oh, it's billions of years old. But that is a worldview perception. Now, some people, myself included, look at the world very differently. We see that there is a creator God who has brought everything into being through the power of his will and his word. So what I see when I look at the world is a created universe, and that's a completely different worldview, so I interpret the evidence in a different way. Mm. So with those biblical glasses on, what would you say the Bible says about truth then? Well, the Bible claims to be truth, and some people say, yes, but that's a self-testimony, so, I mean, you can't believe that. But if indeed it is the truth, then it's a perfectly reasonable thing for the Bible to claim. So the best response really is to test it and to see if in fact the Bible is true. Does it pass tests? You know, the Christian faith really rests on the truth claims of the Bible. So if the Bible can be shown to be wrong, then in fact the whole fabric of the Christian faith is really torn to shreds. So what's interesting too is that the Bible actually invites people to test it. In the Old Testament, it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And then in the New Testament, it says, test all things, hold on to that which is good. So the Bible invites us to examine the truth claims that it makes. It's really interesting. I I don't think a lot of people would know that the Bible is actually telling us to test it. I think you're right, because there are a lot of religions out there who say you cannot challenge our holy book. In fact, to do so would be considered apostasy, Yes, in some cases punishable by death. Mm. But the Bible is completely different. It invites people. You see, when we're operating in the realm of truth, we have nothing to fear, because truth is like light. It shines light into a situation. And if there's no darkness there, there's nothing to fear. Mm. It's when we have lies that we have the possibility of things that will harm us in some way, uh, deceptions, uh, things that we can be badly misled on, uh, and so on. So let's go back to um, this idea of you mentioned science and truth. Um, many, I've heard many people say that science determines truth, but you've talked about Not necessarily. Um, Can you explain that for us in a bit more detail? Sure, sure. I think a good way of thinking of it is that science can only uncertainly approach absolute truth, but it can reveal absolute error. Now, you might be thinking, hang on a minute, scientists can make observations of things, Mm -hmm. and, and that's true. Some other scientists can repeat it, and all of that is true. But for instance, um, let me give you an example. Back in the middle 1800s, scientists observed that the orbit of Mercury had curious, uh, unpredictable characteristics. The, Mm. The point of closest approach to the sun seemed to be actually moving as though the whole of Mercury's orbit was rotating slowly. And when you applied the conventional laws of motion, the Newtonian physics, Uh, as was understood then in the middle 1800s, it didn't predict such behaviour. And so people postulated maybe there's some hidden planet somewhere or some form of effectively dark matter, if you will, that was influencing Mercury's orbit. And then in the early 1900s, around uh, 1915, Einstein published his theory of general relativity. And suddenly it exactly explained the anomalous behaviour of Mercury's orbit. So with more discovery, more truth was found. So if we'd stopped at Newtonian physics, then we would not have had all of the truth. So maybe we don't have all of the truth either with Einsteinian physics. Maybe there's something yet to be discovered. So can you see that science only uncertainly approaches absolute truth. It could be, just could be, that tomorrow someone will conduct an experiment that will cause us to 
have to abandon our cherished theories or modify them substantially through some new discovery. Because mm, we then might understand more about something than we Absolutely. Did mm. That's right. That's right. Now, on the other side, science can, in fact, reveal absolute error. For instance, I could make a claim that water boils at 90 degrees centigrade at one atmosphere pressure. You could conduct an experiment and you discover it boils at 100 degrees centigrade. So you could say, Mark, that's wrong. So you've revealed an absolute error. I'm wrong. <laughs> it boils at 100 degrees. So science is capable of revealing error, but it only uncertainly approaches truth. So we can't really determine truth solely by science, particularly when it comes to dealing with things in the past. So when we start to discuss origins, whether we came about through random processes, the evolutionary story, or whether the universe was created, science only makes observations in the present. So we can't actually observe the past because we don't have the past. Mm, I don't have a time machine. I can't go back. No, that's right. We can't go back and see what happened, particularly in relationship to origins. Another aspect of this is that scientific statements need to be falsifiable. So, for instance, um, I could say to you, as I did before, water boils at 90 degrees centigrade at one atmosphere pressure. Now, that is actually a scientific statement because it can be tested. That happens to be wrong, <laughs> but it's a testable statement. But if I were to say to you, dinosaurs evolved into birds 300 million years ago, well, that's actually not a scientific statement because it can't be tested, but it's a statement of belief about things in the past. So can you see how a scientist's belief system influences how he interprets the data? So he looks at some fossils and he sees fossils of dinosaur, fossils of birds, and then he says, oh, dinosaurs may be evolved into birds. So, but that's that's an expression of belief. It's actually not a scientific statement It's not at what all. he's observed. <laughs> no, no, it's not what he's observed. That's exactly right. So science is limited to repeatable observations. So it's therefore limited in its capacity to reveal truth. Now, our origins matter a lot in exploring this question of what is true and what is not. Because if our universe is created, it means there must be a creator. And that changes the whole game. Because now you and I and everybody viewing this video have been made. There is a creator God. And if there's a creator God, that probably means we will one day confront that God and perhaps be called to give an account of how we've lived our lives. There's and implications here, isn't there? That's right. There are moral implications. Mm. And this God reveals something of his characteristics in the creation around us. Now, just to reinforce this point, though, it's not. this is not something that... Um, people like myself have invented, people who believe there's a creator. Because even the atheistic scientists recognise that data is interpreted. I'd like to share a quote with you from very famous scientist Stephen Jay Gould. And he was quite open about this. And let me read this quote. He said, facts do not speak for themselves. They are read in the light of theory. Now, theory, of course, is what we believe. It's what we've got on the table to discuss. Creative thought in science, as much as in the arts, is the motor of changing opinion. Science is quintessentially a human activity, not a mechanised, robot-like accumulation of objective information leading by laws of logic to inescapable interpretation. Mm. But that's the concept people generally have, the scientist in the white lab coat with the clipboard collecting data, and therefore it must mean this, therefore we have found truth. But no... It's very much a human activity, as Stephen Jay Gould points out. Mm, it's a really important distinction. So how, how do we define science then? Well, I think science uh, is, well, there are a lot of definitions, but one of the key aspects is that it must depend upon repeatable, observable experiments. Mm -hmm. That's a key. And because we can't do repeatable experiments on our origins, origins is really outside of the scope of science. You see, science studies repeatable things, but it's history that studies unrepeatable things. So here's an interesting distinction, you see, a, a distinction often missed. 
When science makes pronouncements about origins, the scientist and the scientific community are reflecting their beliefs about origins, not scientifically proven facts, their beliefs. So now we come down to the question of, well, what is true? Mm. Are their beliefs true? And that now comes down to, I think, the rock bottom point, which is our motivation. What have we chosen to believe? So the secular scientist believes that there is no God, that we have to explain everything in purely natural terms. There is no choice because there's no God. But the biblical creation scientist, such as myself, recognises that there is a God, there is a creator, and most importantly, he's given us an historical record that tells us what actually happened right at the very beginning. And when you read that, it makes a whole raft of difference in everything that we see and understand and how we interpret the evidence. I love talking about this distinction with students because we're obviously presented with one of these worldviews uh, in our textbooks, um, on the nature shows that are so often on Netflix, etc. cetera, we're, we're seeing shows that um, are, are saying, here's something happening and this is science and so it's, say, evolution and it's fact and it's couched in a way that it just looks like they're pointing to facts and then proving the worldview, the story of evolution. And to be able to understand, hang on a sec, if we're talking about the past, then we're not talking about things that we observe and that we can prove it's such an important difference. Absolutely. And uh, to get that difference across is so important. Mm -hmm. Science, if you like, is all about examining the physical world to discover how it works, to reveal the laws of physics, which we then harness to invent amazing things like mobile phones and computers and all the technical stuff that we have today. But trying to understand our origins is a very different field. It's not the same as examining the world around us right now. Let me give you an example, um, slightly amusing one, but let's imagine there are two fleas in the back of your car, very clever fleas, and these fleas have figured out how the car works just by making observations. They realise that it's got a steering wheel, windscreen wipers, it's got lights, it's got an engine and all this stuff. And they work out a lot of the detail about how the car works. And then one flea says to the other, I wonder how the car came to be. And so they try and explain how the car came to be in terms of the processes that they can observe. The problem is the processes of manufacture are totally different from the processes of operation. For instance, they have no idea about factory lines with uh, computerised robotic welding systems, um, assembly and production lines, uh, computer-aided design systems, plastic extrusions and test tracks and all the things that go to making a new model car. It's totally outside their experience and their ability to observe. So they cannot figure out what's happening. There was a series um, years and years ago where a very famous scientist Carl Sagan presented it on um, um, American television, PBS, I think it was. The program was called Cosmos. And in the first program, Sagan walks onto the set and pronounces in very priestly terms, he says, the cosmos is all that there is or has been or ever will be. Now, that sounds so profound. But basically what he said to everybody glued to their TV sets was, there is no God. Now, if he'd come out in, this is back in the 1980s, right? If he'd come out on American television and said, there is no God, everyone turned the set off, right? But the way he did it was beautiful. But essentially he's saying, all we have is the cosmos. So you have to look at the cosmos. It's like looking in a cosmic box at this, this universe. And when you look in the box, you have to try and understand how the box came to be. Not only how the box works, but how it came to be. But you see, it's a whole different discipline. Because looking at how it works doesn't tell you how it came to no, be. No, because the processes of origin are different from the processes of operation. So what we need to discover the truth 
about our origins and therefore us and the world around us and why things are the way they are is an historical eyewitness account of what actually happened. Now, I happen to believe that this book, the Bible, gives us just exactly that because the Bible is God's word and, in fact, it claims to be that. It's the truth, it says, and as we discussed earlier, we need to test it because it invites us to test whether it's the truth. Mm. And the Bible tells us that in just six normal length days, God miraculously spoke the universe into being. Now, no science can hope to unravel how that works. Uh, how does God speaking cause something which did not previously exist to come into existence? It's clearly a miracle. He establishes a working perfect universe. And then, if you read the Bible, you discover that the first man and woman created on the sixth day of that creation week rebel against God. And that rebellion is what has brought suffering and death and misery and all the bad stuff we see around us. We have an origin for pain. And, and, and lies and deceit and all of those things um, are all found in the historical record, which we could not possibly know by making observations in the present, because making observations in the present cannot reveal the truth about the past. Now, when we understand our history and how we came to be, then we can begin to address this question of what is truth? Mm. We're going to come back to um, these biblical references to truth a little bit more, but can I ask, we're talking about um, looking at the past. What about forensic science? Doesn't that tell us things about the past? Well, yes, it does. It attempts to reconstruct the past, but forensic science, once again, because it's dealing with unobservable events, things which happened in the past, is exposed, therefore, to some degree of um, doubt, shall we say. So there's room for multiple interpretations of the evidence. Now, forensic science has uh, achieved some wonderful breakthroughs in uh, all kinds of court cases and what have you, and by analysis, scientists are able to eliminate some claimed series of events by saying that's not possible because the evidence says this, this, and this. But it can also go wrong. And there was a, a classic case back in the 1980s in Australia where a lady called Lindy Chamberlain and her family were at uh, Ayers Rock, Uluru, in the centre of Australia. They were camping and a dingo came into their tent when the parents weren't there and took the baby and disappeared with it. Now, this caused an extraordinary... It hit the headlines, can you imagine? Um, she claimed that it was stolen, but then people started to think maybe she actually murdered the child. And so public opinion started to shift in this whole debate, partly through what the media was saying. And the forensic scientists actually convinced themselves that the evidence did indeed point to her having murdered her baby. She was convicted of murder. She went to jail. There were appeals that happened. And then finally the truth came out and she had been telling the truth all along. How did they convince themselves? Well, how, exactly. How could you? So what they were looking at was evidence that they interpreted as being blood. It turned out to be rust proofing in the car. Um, I mean, really. And what, what changed the tide here was some years later, somebody found the little jacket that the baby had been wearing and that reversed everything. Now, it caused the whole thing to be, the case to be reopened and re-examined. But the forensic scientists got it wrong. You see, they had in their minds decided that Lindy Chamberlain was guilty. And so they interpreted the evidence that they had in that light. Mm, they had guilty glasses on looking they through. They had guilty glasses. Mm. That's right. Instead mm. of looking at it um, objectively, if that's possible. Wow. You see... There's a myth around that scientists have this uh, air of neutrality, that they can investigate the evidence and go where the evidence leads. But as that quote from Stephen Jay Gould illustrates, um, facts do not speak for themselves. They are interpreted and always interpreted by the scientist's belief system. Were you suggesting before when you were referring to the Bible, God's word, um, that 
it has more authority than this science that we're talking about? Yeah, I believe it does because the Bible is an eyewitness account of what God did right at the very beginning. Now, it claims to be that, and as we test the evidence around us, we discover that, in fact, the evidence is overwhelmingly in support of that. And in this video series that we're filming, there are a number of sessions that address the evidence that show, for instance, that the earth cannot be old, that dinosaurs cannot be old, that the evidence all lines up with the account of creation in the Bible, uh, that God created miraculously with um, you know, miraculous events happening in that creation week. And it did not take place randomly over billions and billions of years with mankind appearing right at the end of the process. So when we interpret the evidence in the light of the historical record, the truth, it makes an awful lot of sense. Whereas there are so many conundrums in science now that don't make sense when the data is viewed from the perspective of there being no God, random processes over billions of years. These things don't actually uh, get, don't stack up. They're not supported by the observable evidence. So if we're using the Bible as the authority then, I've heard people say all the time, wasn't it just written by normal men? Yeah, that's a common objection. Um, and that's a good question, actually. So what what this comes down to really is a question of, is the Bible the correct holy book? Is it divinely inspired? And there are a number of lines of evidence I think we can pursue, and we're going to pursue those in a bit more detail in another uh, video in this series. But um, just quickly, one of the things that God could include in a book that he had in effect authored uh, and that humans could not is perfectly fulfilled prophecy because we cannot tell the future. We can't even tell what's going to happen in two hours from now or one hour, let alone many, many years from now. But God can because he is outside of time. He's the creator of the space, time, matter universe in which we live. So we find in the Bible perfectly fulfilled prophecies that were written centuries before the event and are fulfilled. And I don't mean vague things like, you know, a tall, dark, handsome stranger will come into your life or some sort of nonsense like that. I mean very specific prophecies that have been perfectly fulfilled. Um, there are other lines of argument as well that uh, attests to the divine authorship of the Bible. And remember, we spoke earlier about the Bible inviting us to test it. And when we do, we discover that the Bible passes every examination that can be brought by, by scientist, by historian, philosopher, theologian, because it is in fact true. And we can have total confidence that it is the source of truth. It alone, in fact, is the source of truth. And as we've said, I, I can't think of another holy book that um, one invites us to test it, but also um, has recorded prophecies, specific prophecies that we can see have come true. That's right. And But there, there is an issue here, though. Some people say, yes, but God speaks to us through the creation. So why can't we look at the world around us and consider that to be, if you will, a 67th book of the Bible? Hmm. Why isn't the creation just as... Um, uh, trustworthy as his special revelation to us in his word, the Bible. And I guess the answer to that question is that, once again, when you read the history book, you discover that because of Adam and Eve's rebellion against God, the creation has been cursed and that the whole of um, the, the creation is now, to use the phraseology of the book of Romans, is in bondage to decay. Everything is running down. In fact, that's a scientifically established law now. So what we see around us is a broken universe. It's not the perfect universe that God originally created. So when we look at this broken universe, it cannot give us as authoritative a view of origins as what God's special revelation in his word does. Mm, so we might see a little bit of him in part, but really the authority is in his word. Yes. We can see enough 
to know that there must be a God, to know something of his divine nature and his power, to sense his innate goodness because of the beautiful way he's made us and living organisms and so on. But in fact, we know enough that the Bible says that people are without excuse for rejecting God. So anybody who looks at the world around us can discover and logically deduce, in fact, even instinctively be aware that there is a God who has created this world. Now, it's a confusing world because, as some people say, do you mean to tell me that God created this amazing world and created us just so he could watch us live and then suffer and then die? I mean, what, question. What kind of God is that? Yeah. But you see, you can't make sense of that question without reading the history book. And there you discover that it was our rebellion against God that led to all the bad stuff happening. God didn't create this world a mess. He's not like that. He's a powerful, good, purposeful God. He speaks things into being. His word accomplishes what he intended and it's fulfilled in perfection. That is our source of truth. So examining the world around us is not like a 67th book of the Bible. Sadly, there are even some Christian leaders who have accepted the secular scientific community's interpretation of the evidence around us, i.e. the evolutionary story, and they try and mix it into the Bible. And so they believe in the Big Bang and the millions and millions of years and all this sort of stuff, but it leaves a real dilemma because, for instance, we cannot effectively answer the question, if God is good, then why is there so much bad stuff in the world? And we've addressed that question in another session in this video series. So the only way we can find truth is through the revealed word of God. And, you know, he's given it to us in a book which in itself is brilliant because we have a written record which is not subject to the sort of Chinese whispers problem of being passed down verbally uh, as in some verbal traditions. We have a written record. And yes, it was written by people, but written uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So what those people wrote was in accordance with God's purposes and without any errors. So that's why we can have complete confidence that the Bible indeed is the truth. And archaeologists have made discoveries that help us understand that it hasn't changed over time. Um, That's right. That's right. In fact, there was one famous archaeologist who says, I do my archaeology with, um, uh, you know, a shovel in one hand and a Bible in the other because the Bible gives us an extraordinarily accurate record of the history of the human race. And if we're not believing that as truth, um, does that mean we're believing lies? Well, in effect, yes, because in the opening chapters, in chapter 3 of Genesis, it tells us how the enemy came in the form of the serpent and he deceived Eve. They took that forbidden fruit and ate it. You see, he is a liar. And Jesus spoke about him and said, he is the father of lies. He's been lying from the beginning. Isn't that amazing? So there is an enemy to our souls. Why he is an enemy is, um, I guess, a theological question that many people struggle with, but the reality is he's there. And I think perhaps he's envious of the fact that we alone in all of the universe were made in God's image He was not. The Bible tells us he was originally an angel called Lucifer who had an extraordinarily high position in the angelic hosts, but um, envy was found in him, pride, I think it says. And so he was cast out of heaven. So there is an enemy to our souls and he seeks to kill, steal and destroy. But Jesus has come so that we can have life, it tells us in the book of John. Mm. So do you think it matters then if we are believing these lies that um, he would, that the enemy would have us um, kind of build our foundations on? Oh, I think it matters a great deal. You see, if you build your life on a lie, it means you're going to limit your ability to flourish in, in emotional, intellectual, psychological, physical ways in every area of human life. 
Whereas it's truth that actually liberates us and sets us free. And that's why the Bible tells us that the truth will set us free. So it's so important that we discover what truth is. So I think a very good definition is of truth is anything which is consistent with the mind, the will, the purposes, and the glory of God. And that definition covers every aspect of life, physical things, spiritual things, emotional things, psychological things, and so on, every part of our being. And if we pursue those truths, then I think we maximise our prospects of flourishing in every area of human existence. Mark, Christians will often even say that Jesus claimed he was the way, the truth and the life. What's he talking about? Yes, that that is true. (laughs) He said that in John chapter 14, verse 6. And so what he's laying out there is a very big claim. So he's saying, I am the way. That means the way to God. He says, I am the truth. Now, that's really interesting because essentially what he's saying there is that truth is not some vague philosophical concept um, out there, you know, whatever. It's actually ultimately resident in the person of Jesus. So Jesus is truth personified. The words of Jesus are truth. His, His attitudes, his heart for people... That's the essence of truth, and it reflects God's love for every single human being, and therefore the extraordinary sacrifice that he made so that we could be in relationship with our creator God, and that, of course, is through his crucifixion and subsequent resurrection. And then he went on to say, and the life. So when we are aligned and in relationship with Jesus, we can live the most fulfilled, satisfying life there can be. And I can't um, say enough about how precious being in relationship with my Creator is for me. Because without that knowledge, without that understanding, without that relationship, I have no idea of why the world is the way it is. I have no idea about the fact that he loves me, that I'm precious in his sight, that he's blessed me with gifts and abilities that he wants me to use in his service and for his glory, and that I have an eternal destiny with him, life that will never end. The picture without him is quite purposeless and lacking in so much. And isn't that what we see in the world around us? People um, are searching for truth in all kinds of ways, Um, often trying to distract themselves so that they kind of avoid the issue somehow or other, but ultimately you can never avoid it. So you've pointed out that the Bible's actually really clear about how we define truth and that it's actually found in a person, Jesus Christ. That's refreshing in a world where (laughs) there are so many ideas about truth and even for each individual it can be so vague. Um, what What should we do with this? Well, I think the invitation that is there in the Bible is for us to come into relationship with our Creator. That's what God so desires for each and every one of us. But the question is how? And people have tried to think, how do do I clean up my act? How do I get good enough to be acceptable to God? But here's the thing. It's completely impossible for us to fulfill the standards of a holy and righteous God who's revealed himself as totally perfect in every way. So what do we do? Well, there's nothing we can do. So God has done it all, and that's the message of the Bible. He did it all by sending his son, Jesus, who is the son of God, but in human form. You know, it's interesting that Jesus, when he was in front of Pilate at his mock trial, you might remember he said in response to Pilate's question, you know, what is truth? And Jesus said to him, "Um, I have come into the world for this purpose. Now, sometimes when I'm with an audience, maybe a small group, I might ask them, why did Jesus come into the world? 
and you'll get answers like, oh, he came to save us from our sins, hmm. which is a fantastic answer indeed. It's true. That's what Jesus did. His sacrifices set us free from the sinful past that we have and so on. But that's not what Jesus said. And other people will say, oh, well, he came to defeat the works of the enemy. And how true is that? Because he fulfilled all the righteous requirements of the law. He nailed them to the cross, it says in the New Testament. So he defeated the enemy. But that's not what Jesus said. So it usually gets people thinking at this point, I want to share with you what he actually said. And we find this in John chapter 18 and uh, verse 37. I think this is really compelling because he said, you say correctly that I am a king. He says, for this reason I have been born and for this reason I have come into the world. And here it is, to bear witness to the truth. Isn't that amazing? Jesus came to bear witness to the truth. That was his primary objective. And he goes on and says, everyone who is on the side of truth hears my voice. Now, isn't that interesting? That means there are sides. There are those who are on his side, who believe in him, and they hear his voice. But there are those who reject Jesus and they don't hear his voice. You see how important it is that we understand the source of truth and that we seek truth out. Truth is indeed the person of Jesus. Jesus lived a human life as the Son of God. He experienced all that we experience, but without sin. And he was the one who paid the price for our sin. And that price, the Bible tells us, is death. If you think about it, Adam and Eve cut themselves off from the source of all life through their rebellion. The only possible outcome was death. But Jesus took that consequence onto himself, even though he was sinless. He paid the price for every man's, every person's sin uh, for all time. But then God raised him from the dead, which of course means he has defeated death. It establishes that he is indeed the Son of God. And that gives a hope for every single believer. Because the Bible says that when we repent and believe at that moment, we are what's called born again. God places his own Holy Spirit into our hearts and we become his children. And we, it, it's like a, an, an indelible mark on us that guarantees our inheritance for all of eternity. You know, the gospel message is extraordinary, but it's not through our good deeds. Our salvation is entirely by grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone, by the authority of the word of God alone, and for God's glory alone. They were the five pillars of the Reformation back in the 1500s, the time of Martin Luther. And it just so beautifully encapsulates what an extraordinary gift God has given to every single person who will, by faith, choose to believe. I think the Christian's message of the gospel is amazing. It is irresistible if only people actually understood it. Now, the enemy wants to confuse, he wants to add error and lies into this to deflect people from taking that step. But the Word of God beautifully reveals God's plan of redemption for mankind. What an amazing truth to be able to hang on to. I don't need to do anything. I can hear God's Word and His truth and believe it. Amen. Thank you so much, Mark, for sharing this amazing truth with us. Thank you, Jess. 